Okay, let's turn to 1 Corinthians 15. I just want to show you a verse here. I just want to talk about, you know, what is baptism for the dead? You know, because a lot of people, you know, well, it's the Mormon church, well, not a lot of people. I guess there's a lot of Mormons, but, you know, the Mormons, um, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, they call themselves, um, believe in this doctrine called, you know, baptizing people for the dead. Um, baptizing people on behalf of dead people. And where do they get that from? They get it from 1 Corinthians 15. It says here in um, verse 29, Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? If the dead rise not at all, why are they then baptized for, for the dead? So they'll turn to this verse and they'll say, look, see, there's a baptism for the dead. Otherwise, why would Paul be writing? Else what shall they do uh, but which are baptized for the dead? If the dead rise not at all, why are they then baptized for the dead? So they'll say, look, there is a baptism for the dead. And that's all we're doing. We're just doing what the Bible is talking about, baptizing uh, in, on behalf of dead people. Now, a couple of points I just want to bring, bring up here, and I just want to explain this to you, what I believe this verse is saying. Um, you know, number one, if baptism doesn't save you on earth, because baptism doesn't wash away your sins, why would it save you in hell when the person in hell is not even the one getting baptized? Do you know what I mean? So that means if, if you can get baptized for the dead, why don't you get baptized for the living? Like, get baptized for everyone. If you can save people from hell, in hell, then save people from going to hell by getting baptized for everybody now. Just baptize one person six billion times and just baptize for everybody and save them. So baptism doesn't save on earth. It doesn't wash away sins on earth. What, what good will it do to somebody who's burning in hell? And they're not even the one getting baptized. Um, and, and sometimes I just wonder, how, does, how do people even get sucked into these false doctrines? How do people even get sucked into believing that baptism can wash away sins, that baptism can wash away the sins of somebody in hell? It, it's kind of like Catholics believing in transubstantiation. And what I mean by that is they believe that when we break bread and we drink of the cup, that somehow magically that bread and that juice actually turn into the physical body and physical blood of Jesus. I just don't know how people can be sucked into that sort of thinking because with transubstantiation, you can scientifically prove it wrong. I mean, you can take that bread and take that juice and then go put it in a lab and show that it's still juice and it's still bread. How can they then believe that it turned into the body and blood of Jesus? I, I guess that they would say, well, it's just at that moment in time when you take it, it's the body and blood of Jesus. But when you go and test it, well, you know, conveniently, it's um, you know, still bread and juice. You know, it reminds me of what Ken Hovind says, you know, when he talks about arguing from silence, he says, you know, a watermelon, because we're going to have watermelon later on, later on and you guys are going to cut it. You s they say, you know, well, that watermelon is actually blue on the inside. But when you cut it, it turns red. That's sort of the same argument of transubstantiation. They say, you know, well, it is bread and it is juice, but when you eat it, you know, when you can't test it anymore, now it's the body and the blood. Um, it reminds me of that argument. So... It, it, how do people get sucked into believing these sorts of things? I don't know. But, um, you know, this is why we need to know the Bible. This is why we need to be in a Bible-believing church so we don't get sucked into thinking these, uh, these silly things. Um, now, one explanation of this verse is, you know, they'll say that, well, because the Corinthian church was actually baptizing people for the dead. So the Corinthian church were, were, were like the first century Mormons who were baptizing people for the dead. And Paul was just pointing out their inconsistency and saying, you know, you're baptizing people for the dead, but if the dead don't rise, why are you even doing it? You know, that's, that's one explanation. I don't think that's the best explanation. I think the best explanation of this verse is the pe reason why people get confused into thinking why this is baptism for dead people is because they're, mi they're misunderstanding, I think, this phrase, the baptism for the dead. Um, because we have to read this verse. Remember, this verse is in the context of a whole chapter, isn't it? 1 Corinthians 15. And I'll just see if I can find it quickly. Um, yeah, let's just read uh, from verse 15. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, 
Because he's saying that because the Corinthian church is, is saying to them that Christ didn't rise from the dead. So he's saying that, you know, we are we are testifying that Christ is raised from the dead. But he says we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up. And if so be that the dead rise not. So who's the dead there? Jesus Christ. If the dead rise not, for if the dead, Jesus Christ rise not, you know, then is not Christ raised. So he's making that connection there that the dead is talking about Jesus Christ not rising again, if in fact the dead do not rise from, from the dead. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. So what is the context of 1 Corinthians 15? It's about, you know, we see in the first couple of chapters, it's the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection. And then he talks about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, saying if Christ didn't get raised again, then your faith is vain. And then he talks about later on what's actually going to happen in the resurrection, that we're going to put on a new body, and, and, and it's going to be great. And the conclusion is, you know, because we're going to rise from the dead, therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For, you, for as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And I love that verse because sometimes when we go out soul winning or we're doing stuff for God and we think our labor is in vain, it's a great reminder that our labor is not in vain in the Lord. And we thank God for that. So with that in mind, what is that verse, uh, verse 29? Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then baptized for the dead? Well, with that understanding in mind, we can see here that that verse is probably talking about your, your baptism being vain if Jesus Christ didn't rise from the dead. Remember in Romans 6, baptism represents being buried and dying with Christ that one day we would be raised in the likeness of his resurrection. But if he didn't get raised in the likeness of his resurrection, why would we want to be baptized into his death? So that's why he's saying, well, what you're baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, you're baptized with his dead. It's going to mean nothing if Jesus Christ didn't even rise from the dead. Because the reason why we want to be baptized into his death, into the likeness of his death, because one day we want to be raised in the likeness of his resurrection.